All right. Hi, everybody. Thank you so much for joining. Oh, it's so amazing seeing all of you here. I'm so curious. I would love to see in the chat who has come to any of our previous events before, or maybe if this is your first time, welcome. We are just getting started right now. We are just waiting for Rick to get back and then we will jump right in. So again, just let us know where you're coming from, maybe any intentions that you might have for today's meditation and mindfulness circle. And then again, if you've come to any of our events previously, I would love to know just that, just type it away in the chat. All right. Portugal, hello, Portugal. Northern Carolina, Ireland. Hi, everybody. Welcome. So I just want to start off. Let's just go ahead and jump into what we're going to be discussing today and who I am. So for those of you who don't know me, my name is Nadia Hassan, and I'm the founder and CEO of Zaya. And Zaya is a digital holistic healthcare platform that's improving the delivery of mind body care for people with chronic health conditions. And so one of the things that I love to do is to put together these events and these meditation and mindfulness circles and really collaborating with other healthcare practitioners to really improve um, accessibility and education to holistic care. And so Today's discussion is on developing self-love and self-compassion. And I have here with me Rick Center. And Rick is the incredible trauma and stress counselor meditation teacher um, that has been with me and doing these meditation and mindfulness circles every month. And I'm so excited, Rick, for us to get started on this topic today because it is a topic that speaks very dearly to me, something that very strongly resonates with me and this entire journey um, on self-love discovery. And it's a very wild and beautiful journey. And um, I'd love for us to kind of get started just talking about what is self-love. And I think actually one thing that I wanna note before we get started is how I really believe it's, it's more about self-acceptance -accept than it is about self-love. And I think self-acceptance is the first step to cultivating self-love within yourself. And I almost want to rename this, the title of, the, of this circle, just because self-acceptance is really at the core of what we really need to come back to ourselves. Um, but yeah, I'd love, I'd love for us to get started. Rick, uh, go ahead. Hi, everybody. Um, yeah, that's, that's really beautiful, Nadia. Um, because it really is about self-acceptance so it's like we have this thing self-love and i know when we were making this title this topic i go it's like oh i love you rick you're so beautiful and, and i you know for me i sometimes think that can be you know the western way we think oh you're so marvelous you're so great and if i can't feel that every single moment what's wrong with me and it's like you know i go well that's a little mushy and but what's it like to actually acknowledge my human my whole humanness mm -hmm. that life is, you know life isn't easy that it can actually be difficult and how do we accept that with our good heart with kindness that every one of us goes through difficulty and why is that because we have a human body it has sensations and it has feelings and emotions to it and sometimes it's, it, it's difficult when we go through things so this is actually from my book, um, and it's called, it's under kindness, a chapter. It says, life is not so easy at times. Kindness towards others and ourselves changes everything. We have more space to recognize negative thinking habits that close off the heart of goodness. And so I think the way that I'd like to present this is like, let's look at what gets in the way of being kind, of being compassionate towards myself. How does that sound? Instead of like, oh, I should be all the time and 100%. Well, let's see what gets in the way of that. 
And a lot of that is our thinking and our habits and our patterns and things that happen to us. And so one thing that I always like to do in these talks is to share in a way that in our life as an animal body and survival, we need to know when something's discomforting. I need to know because if you figure, you know, we go back to hunter gather, I need to know if I turn around and it's like, you know, there's a bear at my door. <laughs> this isn't good. Or a tiger or an alligator. I need to know when to run or the huns are coming in. So we actually have to lean into the direction of my breath getting tight, something uncomfortable. I hear something. I need to be aware. But what happens to it because of who we are as human and we've been we pass on generations of dysregulation and kindness. It's all about me. And when it's all about me, that means there's no space for you. And so then we can have actions. And we, what we do is we keep leaning in to the negative and early child development or things that have happened. So now we're looking more for everything to be on the negative side versus when it's not. It can get to the point where someone is talking in a way that, how could they say that? Well, the reality is someone could say anything they want. I'm not in their head. I always tell someone, if, if you wanted me to say something and you expected, please tell me and then I can repeat that to you. But if you want to have the conversation with me, you're going to learn who I am through the conversation. And if it's not so personal, because it comes from my life, there's more sharing. And when there's more sharing, we feel better about ourselves. We're kinder. We're more, we're more compassionate. So you could say another way of self-acceptance is we're nourishing the good heart. So if we're unable to pause and acknowledge ourselves and our lives and our feelings, we walk past this one person who's the most important person in, our, in ourselves. So we need to notice when there's a basic discomfort arising, a tightness, something that's uncomfortable because it leads back into that sense of survival. But if I can see it, feel it and breathe, I can see more clearly what's going on. And when I have clarity, I'm not taking life so personal and I'm beginning to see that we're all moving in life. We're all trying to get through it. Mm -hmm. And when we're all, and when I can recognize that, that's that self-acceptance. I think that Nadia is saying this like, yeah, this isn't easy. This has been tough. You know, it's like recognizing my childhood instead of like, I can go over it and loop, you know, how could they have treated me that way, my sibling or my parents, what they did. And it may be they did treat us incorrectly, you know, and that's the history of generations of our family and it's not changing. But if I keep thinking, how could they have done that? I'm leaving out the thought. It's like, wow, that was tough. That was really hard. And if you notice what I automatically do, I bring my hand to my heart. That was tough. And now I'm bringing compassion. And when I'm bringing compassion, um, it's actually, I can feel it in my eyes. It's like, yeah, there were some tough times Rick had in his life. And so I can feel that already in my face and in my heart. And I can pause and I can breathe with that. And that means I'm learning to slow down and accept myself. I'm learning to see who's really important. And often we, we don't, what I would say, we need to look in the mirror and the person you see reflected back at you, send them your love in your heart. Because the reflection of the person who's looking at you needs your love more than you in the world needs our blame. And that's how we cultivate, which is what we're trying to do. We're trying to cultivate this garden of compassion and kindness. So it's so important to see what gets in the way of that. And that's often what we're not doing. We're, we're grasping and saying, well, I need more of this. I need more of that. But what's keeping me from having it? And that's the importance of mindfulness and reflection and kindness is like, oh, I can reflect on some of the habits or ways I've been thinking and, and maybe become more aware of it. And I can start to change that. So I don't know, Nadi, if you want to, is there anything you want to toss in on that? And then we can do a little meditation. Um, yeah, I mean, I, that's definitely something when you're talking about how the person that we're looking at is the very person that needs to love the most. And sometimes that can be so blinding for us and sometimes very difficult for us to accept, you know, this person that we might 
hang like have so much hatred or aversion to is the very person that needs the most love um so yeah no i i love that it's beautiful yeah and so you know part of i would ask someone well when we there's a difference between self self critiquing and saying something that it's like you know i just uh, rick you said that again <laughs> and feeling and feeling the tightness like oh my gosh my mouth went off one more time if I can feel that without beating myself up, that's the teacher. The uncomfortableness is showing me who I want to be, the motivation and intentions of the type of person I'm developing and who I am, which is so important because underneath all this is our motivations and intentions. That can actually begin to break yeah. that habit. You know, it was like looking at, let's say I had something here. I'm looking on my computer. Where did it go? I had it here a moment ago. Um, you know, about this, we I kind believe, of, wanna, yeah. I'm sorry, go on. Yeah, I don't, I lost something on here. Oh, no. But, it, but it's like looking at it, what, what are my motivations? What are my intentions on who I'd like to be as a person? Who mm -hmm. do I want to bring and show the world? And so when I'm cultivating that, it's like a garden. So I'm nourishing. And so what I do, if you think of it as a garden, it's like, oh, I want to I want to grow a, a beautiful flowers. And so I want to grow myself as, as, a, as a kind flower. But then I have to see what gets in the way. It's because those are the weeds. I have to take the weeds out. Well, when I walk around the world, let's say we I've had hurts and maybe a lot. But if I continue, I'm a victim and I'm waiting for everyone else to treat me better than what my family did. Those people are doing the same thing towards me. They're like waiting, waiting for you to change, to treat them. So we, we keep waiting for each other. But if we keep waiting for each other, we're giving up our own selves. We're not nursing our own garden by saying like, wow, that was difficult. And saying it's like, I can choose now how I want to treat myself. And, and I would ask anybody, if you're in negative speak towards yourself and constantly criticizing yourself very negatively, I've never known anyone that's actually said, I end up feeling better. I end up having more compassion and kindness for myself. Mm -hmm. So if I look at it from that and I see, and I've never had anybody that said, oh yeah, I end up feeling really good about life. The more I beat up on myself, whip myself, critique myself, oh, I'm feeling so good. It just feels wonderful. And if we realize it doesn't work, then we wanna try something else. And that's what I'm gonna ask if there's anybody here that is very good at using that whip on yourself. If it hasn't been working, why do you wanna keep using it? Hmm. If it hasn't been working, why do you wanna keep using it? Instead of saying, well, that's how I was treated as a child, that's where everyone treated me that way. And, and I go, yeah, that's why we need to say, wow, that was a tough time. Growing up was a tough family for me. Now we're showing a little bit of kindness and compassion towards ourselves. And as we begin to that, then we can be looking at these places of joy. And when we're in more joy, we're actually nurturing kindness. We're nurturing self-love. So these are just kind of ideas I just wanted to throw out. Um, and, and I always say in this, if there's anything that I'm saying that doesn't resonate with you, that's okay, throw it out. If there's a couple of things I do say that make sense, then work with those. Because everything I say here may not make sense to everyone. It may or may not. But it's like what we want to do is in life from all the different people that we meet and teachers and schooling, we want to take the pieces that work for us instead of always getting mad when they don't give me 100% of what, what I'm looking for. And that's kind of the same way with our friends and our family. I'm, I'm not expecting 100% from any of them to always make me feel good. It's just, it's not possible. And so the more I don't have to carry that, I can actually just hear more of my family members and friends and just hear and, and watch more what's going on for them. And the more I can open up in that space, that's actually a nice feeling for me. My breath flows. I'm more present. And sometimes I can see a hurt that they're having. So what I'd like to do is um, do a little meditation, if that's okay, because this is our meditation and mindfulness circle. 
And um, that's what I do. I, I teach a lot of meditation. Um, for those of you maybe have been here before, or don't know me. I'm I have a nonprofit, the Mindfulness Care Center, that I began. It's now become Rick Online. I think the past year, doing classes, but um, I do a Tuesday evening meditation and a Sunday morning and a grief and loss group. And that's my background of long over thirty years of meditation, and then teaching it and mindfulness based stress reduction. If any of you know John Kabat-Zinn's work and developing trauma programs with mindfulness. Um, Because my background is also working with trauma, if you're familiar with Peter Levine's work, Somatic Experiencing, and I'm also a Buddhist interfaith chaplain. And so I've been in the hospital, you know, sitting with people and illness and families and people passing away. So that's kind of informed my work. And it's informed my life. It's helped me learn who can I be, you know, what do I want to nurture and the kind of person I want Rick to be in this world. So I trust that. It's not that I trust others. I listen to others, but I trust my own journey. I trust my inner heart. And that's what we're looking to do. So in meditation, we want to slow down, you know, to be able to find all that. So if you need, so I'm going to just lead us through a little meditation for a moment. If you need to like shake your hands out, massage your jaw, roll your shoulders. So this already has been kindness, like, Oh, self-kindness, self acceptance love is like before I'm sitting, just kind of roll my shoulders. It's like just because I'm going to meditate doesn't mean I go I'm stiff and I can't, you know, stretch and wiggle my toes and do different things. And then as I'm aware, like, oh, wow, what's that like when I roll my shoulders nice and easy, shake my hands out. And so there's awareness I'm putting on the physical action of the present moment. So that's what we're doing in the meditation, we're becoming aware of the present moment right here. So just kind of watching, bringing that awareness in, which we all have. You might find your breath, a little movement of the air at the tip of the nose, belly and chest moving, and then start to bring that awareness to notice where there's a contact of the body wherever you are. So you might be on a cushion, a chair, maybe laying down on bed or a couch standing so you can start like noticing oh where's the weight of my feet depending if I'm standing how I'm sitting it could be a weight on the top of the foot the side the bottom they involve the legs and so through contact of our awareness we notice sensations and that's how we know the human body through sensations And that sensation is a weight. So as I'm bringing my awareness down, I may notice a weight of the body here. And if I bring my awareness to my feet, it could, you know, just point some things out, notice for yourself, it could be tingling, could be a warmth, could be a coolness, a moistness, a dryness, a roughness, a smoothness. Maybe there's a sharpness or an achiness. You know, maybe as I'm bringing my awareness to my feet, it's neutral. I'm not picking anything up. But if we just allow the mind to be with it, we might notice some sort of energy. So that's what we're talking about. The movement of energy is sensations. And so we're not trying to push any sensations away. We're not attaching to any sensations in the meditation. We're just kind of just opening up to noticing sensation one right after another, arising and passing, arising and passing. Because to know the human body, we have thousands and millions of sensations going all day long. That's the knowing of the human body. So starting from the feet and the toes, just whatever's noticed, there's no right or wrong. And I might bring awareness to my calves or my shins. You know, it might be neutral at first. Maybe there's a sense of roundness or stringiness, tightness, holding, itchy, neutral, maybe a warmth or a coolness. So we're becoming aware of the inner and outer body. Coming to the knees. And are my knees achy now or 
I'm not noticing too much or oh, a sense of pulling, depending how I'm sitting, maybe at first or relaxation, a softness, openness, awareness of the thighs, coming to the buttocks and noticing the buttocks and the hips and the pelvic area. And just taking a moment and breathing with this lower half of the body from the pelvic hips and buttocks down to the feet and the toes. Imagine just breathing in that part of the body, these legs like roots. And sometimes I love the image of roots coming out of my feet, going right into Mother Earth and all the nutrients in Mother Earth. And I'm breathing all that, all those nutrients coming up through my feet just to my pelvic and hip area. Then I breathe back down into Mother Earth. This is very grounding to do this. And you can do it any time in your day. Just breathing from the hips on down, Mother Earth back up. And just doing that for a few seconds, just and then allowing that breath to come up a little more to notice the torso that's connected to the pelvic and hip area. So bringing your awareness to notice, oh, there's a lower back the middle back, an upper back, the shoulder blades between the shoulder blades. And it's whatever sensations are there. Again, it could be neutral, could have a sense of flatness, roundness, curviness, and achiness, a sharpness. Maybe it's, oh, it just feels soft and open, flowing. There's no judgment of right or wrong. It's just kind of being with. It's so beautiful just to observe and be with and not have to have judgments about it. And then I might come to the front of the body, notice my belly. Maybe I recently ate, it could have a sense of fullness or maybe I've eaten for a while, could feel empty or open. Maybe it's twisty. Maybe it's fluffy. It's just the nature of a belly in this moment, and it's always changing. Coming up to the chest area where the ribs are. Underneath the ribs, there's this heart and the lungs, all the organs. Trying to do their work. We may notice the feeling tone of inhaling and exhaling. I sometimes speak to my organs and I say, oh, thank you for doing the best you can, trying to all work together. Thank you, heart, for pumping this blood with oxygen all the way into my bones and the skin and the muscle tissue. If you ever pause it, just thank the body for all the work that it does and just breathing with that. And from the torso, we can expand out to the arms, noticing the hands, the palm, the top of the hand, fingers, fingertips, the thumb. What are the feeling tones and sensations arising moment by moment in the hands? We just breathe with awareness of hands. And then coming up, through the wrists, the arms, elbows, shoulders, coming from a neck and a throat to the skull, noticing the jaw, it's big bone and muscle. It's the mouth moisture dry, awareness of cheeks, the nose breathing, the forehead, the eyes, the scalp. Feeling tone of hair on the head or glasses, jewelry on the body, clothing, temperature of the skin. Just allowing yourself to breathe with the knowing of the body. We went from the 
from the toes to the head, the head back down through the whole body, noticing the breath at the tip of the nose, inhaling and exhaling. We're breathing in the beautiful oxygen. We're actually bringing in, breathing the space all around us is oxygen, life-giving air. We're just breathing that in and having awareness of an inner and outer body. And allowing that awareness to refine itself to just more of the breath, the breathing. So that's the movement and action. It's the air at the tip of the nose, the nostrils, the throat moving in and out. On the inhalation, how the belly and the chest have a sense of expanding, rising up, and the exhalation, a release, a letting go. So we'll just take one more minute to just see if we can follow the breath. So the nature of the mind is to think it may want to go down the block, past, future, but just see if you can be the knower, the observer, whenever the mind goes into a thought someplace else. And in the being the knower of the observer, say, oh, okay, let me just again notice the breath from my nose my torso, inhaling and exhaling, being with the experience. So just keeping it simple. Sometimes in your meditation, as we're noticing the body, we can also do a meditation on sound. So as you're aware of the body and our breath right here, just imagine opening to sounds, not grabbing onto any sound, pushing it away, just noticing how sounds arise and pass moment by moment. It might be sounds inside the body. It might be sounds outside the body, outside the room or the building we're in. Just the noticing of sounds arising and passing moment by moment. We'll be ringing the bell in a moment. And just allow your ears to follow the sound of the bell. I'll ring it three times. And after that, then we can begin to wiggle our toes, fingers, and open our eyes. But just see what it's like to just follow the sound of the bell. Allow yourself to wiggle your fingers, your toes, move your legs if you need to, the shoulders, the neck. And when you open your eyes, allow your eyes to just look around the space, the room, wherever you're in, and just noticing the shapes and colors. Just looking at objects as shapes and colors. And as you're doing that, see if you can still notice your body, the weight of the body and the breath. And notice, is there anything in the room that really kind of that brings you joy? Look in your room and say, is there anything that like really puts a smile on your face? I'm looking and seeing some orchids I have by the window. I have to peek above the computer to see them. Or I can look in the computer and see the orchids behind me that all of you see. And I, 
Orchids always make me smile. Don't know why. Never had them growing up. <laughs> I can see one of my Buddha statues around. Now take a moment and notice your mood. Notice your inner mood after we did that. And I'm, I'm curious, anyone have a thought after we've done the meditation? Is anything different a half hour before you joined it, right when you joined it, when you listened to me yakking, and then after the meditation? Or is everything exactly the same? I'm looking in the chat. Yeah, if anybody wants to make a comment, unmute yourself, let her let and raise your hand and Nadia, let Nadia know if anyone would like to just even share verbally. Yeah, so part of these uh, meditation and mindfulness circles that we have is really an opportunity to have an open discussion and it's a safe place to be able to do that. So feel free to unmute yourselves if you have anything to share, but also no pressure. <laughs> So someone said peaceful, more focused, much calmer. I notice things around me that I was not aware exist. Ah, uh, who's just, so somebody said, oh, so noticing around, notice, so when you're noticing things around you, the person that's saying that, can you, un, who's saying that? Um, that um, Christine, Christine, do you un, mind unmuting yourself for a moment? Would you? Allow us to converse. Is that okay? Yeah, I don't think that was me. I think it's Joy no. that said that. Yeah, it was Joy. Joy O'Hara? Oh, Joy. I noticed. Oh, Joy, I'm sorry. Never mind. I'll let Nadia make sure she runs things, not me. Joy. <laughs> it's okay. Joy, are you there? Yeah. Do you want to unmute Joy? Hi. Hi, Joy. Thank yeah. you. Yes, I'm thinking everyone. So as you're noted, can I ask you a question? So as you notice those things that you are not aware of, what's yeah. it like when you're looking at something that you weren't even aware of before? Oh, well, I feel like uh, there's more color around me that makes me feel, you know, alive and happier. Yeah. Isn't that? And all it took was me guiding us for like six or seven minutes. Exactly. Yeah. It, also, yeah. Like when I said things, it's most specifically water, the sound of that water. It, it, I, I was just, I am just aware that, uh, you know, there's a water tank close to me. And then yeah. just, I, I was internalizing. I realized I heard that sound of water that is so comforting. Yes. Yeah, so when we, so this is the beauty of why we want to develop a mindfulness meditation practice because in the calm, because what we're actually looking for in the mindfulness meditation, one of the results is we can start to calm down, but we're actually trying to wake up and liberate ourselves, liberate, you know, the weeds from our garden by slowing down. We see the beautiful things that are there. And the more I can tie those things in of what's really happening in the present moment, it opens my heart to be more compassionate for the difficulties. Yeah. Can you I know? add something to it? Yeah, please, please. We're all learning together. So I yeah. love when it, yeah. Yeah. It feels I'm validated that I, I am alive and living. Yeah. Say that again. I'm. It validates me as a person who's alive and living. Yes. And if you can validate, if what's it like to be able for you to validate yourself versus waiting for me to validate you as feeling well, good or alive and well? Yeah, because, you know, uh, you, if you, you're not aware that uh, you also, uh, uh, you're living your life when you're not validating your feeling or your existence, then you just do things for others without listening to yourself yeah yeah so can i read a can i share something with everybody um where is this so this is something i want to share this and then i want to see if we have time for an exercise thank you joy you're just i, th I think what you're sharing is what we're learning to do so again these are all practices we have to learn to get present 
because we often live in our mind of thought. And when I'm thinking thoughts, and I don't know about any of you, my mind has a good chance of finding four or five and wants to do all day long. And usually those are the thoughts of things that have been bothering me. But if I recognize like, oh, that's bothering me because I thought someone should say something different. They should have smiled at me when I walked into the uh, drugstore. Why didn't the cashier smile at me? Well, it's like, I don't know what's going on with the cashier, but I'm not waiting for them to decide whether I'm going to be happy or not anymore. And that's the key. I'm not waiting for another person, but I need to see my own self and I need to see and listen to me and develop that. So there's a thing called listening and it's in two parts. The first part, I don't know who wrote it, but I heard it. And this was in a class or program I did years ago. And then I wrote the second part. So the first part, again, I don't know who wrote this, but it's called listening. And it goes, when I ask you to listen to me, and you start giving advice, you have not done what I asked. When I ask you to listen to me and you begin to tell me why I shouldn't feel that way, you trample my feelings. When I ask you to listen to me and you feel you have to do something to solve my problem, you have failed me, strange as that may seem. So please just listen and hear me. If you wanna talk, Wait a few minutes for your turn, and I promise I will listen to you. I think that's wonderful, because we don't live in a world where we just pause and listen to each other. And in my, I do grief and loss groups, and I think we're going to talk about that more next month, is, is when we have someone, we all know when we're in a loss or grief, we don't need someone trying to make us feel happy. We just want someone to just sit there and just hold that space with me. So one, in order for me to do that for another, I have to start understanding how we communicate to ourselves. What we're saying to ourselves, our thoughts, am I listening to myself? So this is part two that I wrote off of part one. When my heart asks my mind to listen and it starts giving advice, my mind has not done what my heart has asked. When my heart asks my mind to listen and it begins telling the heart why it shouldn't feel that way, my feelings feel trampled upon. When I ask my mind to listen to my heart and the head feels it must do something to solve the problem, I failed myself as strange as that may seem. So please, mind, just listen and hear the heart. And if you want to talk, wait a few minutes for your turn. And I promise I will listen to you. How often do we do that for ourselves? How often do we really never slow down enough to really hear and listen to our own selves? And in that slowing down to listen and pausing, I can begin to see what needs nurturing for the self-love, for living a human life, kindness and compassion, that self-acceptance, that it's not always easy, but I can learn how to nourish the part by watering my inner garden. And that way I can begin to learn what weeds or things aren't working. So I just think this is so important that we understand that. Self-kindness, self-compassion entails being warm and understanding towards ourself when we suffer, fail, or feel inadequate, whether than ignoring our pain or flagellating ourselves with self-criticism. Self-compassion of people recognize that being this imperfect human being, failing and having all sorts of different experiences in life, because that's the only way we learn through is experiencing and having difficulties. It's inevitable. So if we're really a self-kind and compassionate person, we tend to be gentle with ourselves. When we're confronted with painful experiences, we work with them, see how adjust and move around versus getting angry and being the victim of, of why am I going through a difficult situation now? And it's saying like, what is happening? It's very difficult. Like, wow, it's probably even difficult for the person you know, when I see their red face, oh, we're all having a difficult experience. And now I become part of humanity versus separate. It's like, wow, we're all 
like we're out now in the world, you know, for me, I'm, some of you I know are in Europe, some are here in America. It's like, it's not easy. We're going through a very difficult time. Everybody is. And sometimes it's because we, we don't have enough to slow down a lack of understanding and saying, oh, well, this is the way something feels for me. That's gonna be very different for someone born in a different part of the country with different family environment, different culture, different religion. And, and we need to find a way to hear one another. Even if I'm upset and angry, I don't understand. If I operate from that place, all someone's gonna do is feel hate. And if I operate from hate and anger and tightness, who's the ultimate one living in the anger and the tightness? That's Rick. It's Rick. But if I start to open up and when I do, it's like, okay, slow down a little bit. There's someone that's going through something that you don't understand and see if I can create an openness or a dialogue. I'm not saying it's always easy. And then if I'm not able to, that self-kindness and compassion helps me with boundaries. I need to walk away. Self-kindness and self-acceptance is also needing to build good boundaries of when to walk away, when I can come forward. I'm learning how to sit with difficulty. And the more I can sit with difficulty, I stretch my nervous system. The larger I stretch my nervous system, I stretch my heart. The larger I stretch my heart, I stretch my mind. And I can be then more accepting of what it means to live a human life than living in the creation of what I think human life should be, but it never is proven true. I often find so many people talk about how things should be, but, but, it's not, but it isn't that way. It's how things are. So how do we meet the way things are versus living in this ideal of how they're supposed to be and judging myself and everyone because they're not meeting the ideal that actually may not exist. It might be a nice ideal, but then that needs, I need to start planting the seeds so they can grow. I have to plant the seeds and water it to get the flower to be there. It just isn't there. And we have to do that in ourselves. In the same way, we need to look at what gets in the way. And I, I know there was an exercise we wanted to do. I don't know if we have time for that. What do you think, Nadia? You're muted. I see your, I see you. Yeah, yeah, I said, um, I said, yeah, we can definitely do that. Uh, let's maybe like 10, 12 minutes total, do you think? And yeah. then we can have a little bit of time just to chat. Yeah, is that okay? So we're gonna do, we're gonna put everyone into a breakout room. So with another partner, I want to do an exercise really quick. It's two parts to it. And then we'll come back into the larger group and kind of share if that's okay with everyone. I just, it's, um, so the exercise is um, someone's going to ask a question and the other person answers. So when you go into your breakout room, let's say the person with the shortest hair asks the question, the person with the longest hair will respond and answer it. And every time someone gives you an answer, you say, thank you. So let's say, Nadia, you're gonna ask me the question. So here's the first question and we'll, and we'll put it up, we'll post it and we'll broadcast it in the room. And then um, we'll put the second question in. You'll go back and forth, we'll say switch. So then the first person that was asking the question to the long haired person, the long haired person will ask the question to the shorter haired person. And then we'll have another question. Then we'll come back in and, and see what comes up for everybody. So the question is. Um, um, yeah, I'll go. Uh, uh, what keeps you from feeling joy? So Nadi's asking me what keeps me from feeling joy when I overeat. Thank you. What keeps you from feeling joy? When I get upset with others for not thinking the way that I think they should be thinking. Thank you. What keeps you from feeling joy? And then, yeah. <laughs> so do you see it's a repetitive question of thinking? We'll just do it for like a minute each way. Okay. All right, so, and then um, I'll just put it in the chat here. It says um, long hair person will say, what keeps you from feeling joy? And then the person will respond by saying, thank you. Um, and then we'll say right, switch. So yes and then of course if you don't feel like participating 
of course, like no pressure. Um, I think I'm not sure if you can continue to stay in until we get back and break out of the breakout room. Um, but if you choose, do choose to leave, just know that this is recorded. So you will be able to get access to this later. This is really a great exercise. I've had to do these myself. I learned so much about myself. So we'll put you into the breakout rooms and we'll just be a minute each way. And then there'll be a second question that we'll ask and then we'll all come back and learn together, see what it was like. So I, 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 I hope people say so. Let's put everybody into breakout rooms. This is the first time I'm actually doing oh. that. Well, if it won't work, don't worry about it. Oh, no worries. You know, or, or maybe, you know, we can, do, we can even do it this way. How about this way? You want to do it this way? Mm -hmm. So everyone, because we're, we're just, we're learning how to work this too. So everyone, let me just ask you, and you answer in yourself. How about this way? I'll just do it this way. Okay. We'll do it. So take a moment. So I'm going to ask you, everyone, what keeps you from feeling joy? What keeps you from feeling joy? And for each time you have an answer, just imagine me thanking you for sharing that with me. Like, thank you for sharing that with me. And then I ask again, what keeps you from feeling joy? Thank you. What keeps you from feeling joy? Thank you. What keeps you from feeling joy? And then pause. Just find your body and your breath for a moment. And now I'm going to change the question. I want to ask you, what brings you joy? What brings you joy? Thank you. 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 And then just take a moment and reflect. What did you learn about yourself just from those? Did you learn anything or recognize anything just from asking those two simple questions and taking a moment, a minute for each one to reflect? Is there anything, was it helpful in any way? What did you recognize? And, and then what I'd like to do is open it up you know, for us to share, you can unmute, raise your hand, because we're all learning together. You know, we're trying to learn more about kindness, self-love, what motivates us to be who we want to be in this world, how we like to show up. So anyone want to share? I know people put things in the chat. I'd love to share too, that we can actually talk about these things. And we're all learning together. Was the exercise helpful to even, maybe some of you have done this exercise or never had, just to pause, to look, and like, wow, do I ever look at what keeps me from joy? And do I ever pause to see what actually brings me joy? And I can nourish that even more. When I begin to recognize and when I'm feeling more joy, I think we feel more self-acceptance. I do. It feels good. And I can be more compassionate and realize like, wow, when I do the exercise, everyone, this is tough for everybody in the world. It's not just Rick. It's every human being with feelings and sensations who has a life. So anyone want to share? You're just making me do all the talking? <laughs> I 
Okay, nobody. Yeah. Anything you want to share, Nadia? Yeah. Um, well, I mean, I, I can definitely share myself and, and how I'm how I'm feeling. Um, I think we have somebody, Joy. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. The, the the question and answer. It's really an eye opener that I should put into practice very, um, very often to be able for me to listen to myself and be able to act on my issues. Yeah, yeah. It's so important to slow down, to start to hear ourselves, how we speak to ourselves, how we listen. Yeah, thank you, Joy. Anyone else? I'll share. Um, this is Morgan from Minneapolis. And I've been waking up lately really unenthusiastically about facing my day and getting up anyways and doing what, you know, us adults do and going to work. And I can see how this would really just give me a moment of pause to really look at what is keeping me from feeling joy when I wake up first thing in the morning and what brings me joy and just reframing my perspective is that like those first few moments when when I wake up in my day so thank you this has been magnificent yeah joy, thank you Morgan the key aspect you said I can reframe it that's it no one tells me whether I want to reframe or readjust anything in my life that is not up to anybody else exactly Exactly. And there's, that's huge. When we recognize it's not up to another person to decide when I'm going to pause and find my breath. It's not up for another person to tell me like, wow, there's a little sadness right now. And, and I'm going to acknowledge that and honor it. Whether someone else can feel the sadness or not, or they push it away. You know, I can have compassion for that person that pushes it away, but I'm going to allow myself to feel it. Exactly. Exactly, totally, completely feeling it, right? And not making it wrong that I'm feeling it, yeah. Well, let me ask everybody a question. Whatever you're feeling is what you're feeling, right? It's like, I don't know if any of you, like I hear a knock on the door and says, my feeling says, oh, Rick, can I come in and, and have you feel this? They never ask me that. Even my thoughts don't even ask me. <laughs> they just come in and they're pretty wild and all over the place. But it's like if I acknowledge something, then that's the self. I'm acknowledging what's happening in this thought, in this feeling, in me in this moment. Then I have a choice of how do I want to meet it in, in, in a human. So, all, so the very definition of being human means that we're mortal, we're vulnerable. We're not this ideal of perfection. The perfection is of the moment. And when I meet it, I see that I can get rid of that ideal of perfection, that it's like, oh, I'm feeling this. How do I want to meet it? How do I want to readjust with it? What is the feeling? What's the thought need right now or the feeling? So therefore, self-compassion involves recognizing joy. It involves recognizing suffering, sadness, Sometimes, you know, having to learn something and I don't feel adequate because that's all of us. We only learn through experience instead of saying, oh, I'm a totally inadequate human being. Well, wait a minute. What did I just learn? And I'm learning by actually listening to myself saying I'm inadequate. Well, what does that even mean? I'm an inadequate human being. I'm comparing myself to others. And I can tell you, most people, when they're comparing, I've heard people compare themselves to other people in the work that I do, which is trauma and work. They have no idea what's going on inside that other person. And you can see me up here, but I'm up here speaking through experience. I'm not speaking through a person that doesn't feel anything. I'm not speaking from a person that didn't crash hang gliding and compress my spine. Losing my mother when I was a teenager. I have feelings just like all of you, but I don't run from them. And that's the difference. And when I acknowledge myself as being human, that gives me space to be that way with other people. And that's what I'm trying to cultivate in myself, is how to bring less suffering to myself and to others. That's my intention and cultivation in life. 
but I'm in that journey. Someone else can't tell me what that journey is going to be within me. But I know when I tap into it in a certain way, it can affect other people. That's what we mean. Self-love is that ability to be, oh, this is what I'm feeling right now and acknowledge it and learn how to work with it through the wisdom of the heart, not through a hammer. Mm. Yeah, and also not through shame either. I think that so many times we feel shame towards our emotions because I feel there are so many emotions that have so many different um, like stigmas almost like anger is labeled as bad or some people might view sadness as bad yeah and, i'm sorry no and i'm just saying yeah it's just important to honor those emotions that do come up and to not feel any shame towards them yeah and briefly shame can be very nonverbal. It can come from very early on and when we're young, things that are pre-verbal. It could be how our siblings or parents or somebody looked at us. You know, if I look at you like that, I give you the evil eye, you know, and you're, you're two months old, you're going to start crying, but you're developing like all of a sudden you feel something's wrong because you see it in my face. You've done something wrong. And then if that's happened in our family environment, we're feeling the shame about, I was a baby pooping in my, in my diaper, you know, and my parents didn't like it. And a parent that wanted to clean up a diaper. And so what's happening is we're developing it from early or early on pre-verbal or verbal, but it's like, but if I'm in self kindness and self compassion, it's like, I say, I don't have to pick that up. That was my mother's digress, dysregulation or my father's or my siblings. It's not mine. And now I'm an adult and I have a choice and I don't have to pick that up anymore. And so that's the reframing. I start finding the toolkit that can lessen that grasp on me and not have what happened in the past. So I start building a toolkit, learning how to work with it, you know, different people doing different things to move us forward. So I think we're close, close to time here. Maybe well, we I'll read. have two more minutes. So if anybody else has anything to share, feel free. Um, and then if not, go ahead, Rick. You said you have a poem that you have to read. Yeah. Does someone want to share anything, or I'll read a little poem to end with? I do like poetry, so I I, I write poetry. So I have a book out. People can see that. If you can't change your mood, change your mind. Mindful Reflections Toward Self-Discovery. It's online. And um, I'll read one of the poems in it. I've walked so many miles at times I need to cry. Having lived so many lives, it feels as though the ashes of eternity have slipped through my fingers. If I must shiver from doubt within, it is not for me to seek an answer. You have come to me like a whisper, sitting upon the lips of a lover, speaking so silently, only the soul will hear. Perhaps a tear is what humankind fears most. For you see, I too had been afraid. Yet I continue walking through the fire of life. If not for this heart to look within, how can compassionate wisdom arrive? I could not be me if I did not traverse this path, and you are the chosen one to see, and you are me. So thank you everyone for, for joining in, sharing, participating in any way that you have, and, and I, I hope this is you know, helpful in a little way to just throw into your toolkit, find something from today that can be supportive.